Welcome back to 3 Towers Investing Channel where you can get the latest in finance, investment, and innovation. Warren Buffett is widely considered the greatest and most successful investor of the 20th century. He wasn't born rich, but because of his investing strategy and by defying prevailing investment trends, Warren amassed a personal fortune of more than $60 billion. So in this video, we will be revealing Warren Buffett's secrets. What did he do and what did he realize first before he became rich? Watch this video till the end and I'm sure we'll all learn a lot from the greatest investor of all time. Warren Buffett started investing in 1941 when he was 11 years old. So we are talking about 81 years of investing experience from Warren. At 11, he started picking stocks. He was interested in watching stocks and thought stocks were things that went up and down and he charted them. For the first 8 years, he read books on technical analysis, hundreds of hundreds of pages, and read that whole thing over and over again. He thought the important thing was to predict what stock would do and predict the stock market. When Warren was 20 years old, he read the book The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham and realized that he was doing it exactly the wrong way. He had the whole wrong idea. The Intelligent Investor book was the first step of his journey that changed the way he thinks and changed his life. Buffett said, from that point, he never bought another stock. He bought businesses that happened to be publicly traded. He became an owner of a business and did not care whether a stock went up or down the next day, the next week, or the next month. Warren Buffett said at that time, he didn't have any idea what it would do. He didn't know what the stock market would do, but he knew businesses. Warren surrounded himself with people that bring out the best in him and realized people don't need to be genius to be successful in investing. According to Buffett, investing is a game in which you probably only need 120 points of IQ because 170 doesn't do any better and may even do worse. That's the good thing about it. Warren pointed out that instead of a 170 IQ, what investors really need is the right orientation. Think about what the company is going to be worth in 10 or 20 years now question for you. I don't know if you've had a chance to Google yourself, but if you Google Warren Buffett, you get 25 million hits. And my question is, you're a sitting CEO, you're wealthier than Midas, but everybody thinks you're a champ. How do you do that? <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think I think when you get older, they forgive a lot of things. So I think if I ever make it up to you know George Burns's age or something, and I just have a cigar in my mouth, and <laughs> people people will really love me then. <laughs> You're arguably the most interviewed CEO in history. Is it your ability to communicate that comes from instinct, or is it something you've learned over the years? Well, I certainly learned to speak in public at one time. I was terrified of speaking in public when I was in high school. I avoided any class that would require it, and, and in college. And then I finally signed up for a Dale Carnegie course. Uh, when I got out of school, I realized I had to talk to people. And I spent a hundred bucks. I got this little diploma. I proposed to my wife during the, uh, during the uh, uh, term of the course, so I really got my money's worth there. But in terms of public speaking, I really had to force myself on that. In terms of talking privately, they couldn't stop me from the moment I started I, <laughs> in school or anything. I, I've always, I, I always like to talk. <laughs> How do you keep up with all the media and information that goes on in our crazy world and in your world of Berkshire Hathaway? What's your media routine? I just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of of magazines, I read 10Ks, I read annual reports, and I read a lot of other things too. So I, I, I've always enjoyed reading. I love reading biographies, for example. And you process information very quickly. Well, I have, I have some filters in my mind. So if, if somebody calls me about an investment in a business or an investment in securities, I usually know in two or three minutes uh, whether I have an interest. And I don't, I don't waste any time with the ones I don't, in which I don't have an interest. I, I always worry a little bit about even appearing rude because I can tell 
very, very, very quickly, whether uh, it's going to be something that uh, will lead to something or whether it's, you know, it's just a half an hour, an hour, or two hours of chat or something. When, uh, I think you wrote in an annual report, it was in 2009, speaking about the country, about the economy, uh, we are certain, for example, that the economy will be in shambles throughout this year. The problem was that wasn't the complete quote. It led the impression that you were unduly pessimistic about the country. Uh, how did you respond to that? Yeah, well, I wasn't at all pessimistic about the country. In fact, I wrote an, I wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times in October of 2008, just when the world was kind of falling apart. And I said, the, I said, the world is going to fall apart for a while, but don't worry about it. We're going to come out fine on the other side. And I said, buy stocks. And uh, uh, I've, I've never been pessimistic about the United States. I, I bought my first stock uh, in the spring of 1942. I was 11. And if you remember, you, you, would, you don't remember, <laughs> no one watching this will remember, but, but we were losing the war at that time. And uh, we were getting, we were, we were getting uh, totally creamed in the South Pacific and the Philippines fell and the death march at Bataan and all of that sort of thing. It was not until the Battle of Midway, which was a little later, the thing started turning around. But I was optimistic on the country then and I've been optimistic on the country ever since. And incidentally, the Dow Jones average then was 117,000 now. <laughs> it, it's, no one has ever been a success betting against America since 1776, and they're not going to be a success in the future doing it either. Warren Buffett added that 90% of the people that buy stocks don't think of them the right way. They think about something that they hope goes up next week and think about the market as something they hope goes up and if it's down, they feel worse. Warren keeps his competitive experience in a game where he can win. He always want to do it big, so he puts his whole net worth into city service preferred. March 11, 1942. He has never had less than 80% of his money. Warren owned a piece of American business at least 80% at all times and just don't want to own anything else except for the things his family wants. Owning five homes doesn't mean anything to Buffett because according to him, he's going to be happy in one home. And there's a certain amount of things that go wrong with everything and if he got two homes. There are two things that Warren Buffett make him happiest in what he's doing. First is the fact that he'll win over time. However, Warren made it clear that that doesn't mean he'll beat everyone else or anything like that. He said he's happier when stocks are going down because he can buy more of them with the same amount of money. Warren explained that he'd be happy if he was a farmer. He'd want farmland to go down so he could buy more acreage. The second thing that makes him happiest is being trusted by people. He would rather do what he does with partners than do it sitting in a room himself, even though he might make more money that way. Warren claims the game is very easy if you have the right lessons in your mind about what you're buying. It's very easy to look at the statistics of the United States economy. More people, a greater percentage of the American population, are wealthy now or have more income now than they've ever had. People have more money now and they get mortgages at lower rates than they've ever gotten. Buffett said, Today, Americans live better than John D. Rockefeller was living when he was six years old. John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world and in today, Americans can get better medicine, better education, better entertainment, and better transportation. You can do everything better than he could. He added that if you take what an hour of labor delivered to you 100 years ago and what an hour of labor delivers to you now for you and your family, it's unbelievable. Capitalism says get rid of a referee and a government. We've got a government that can tell capitalism what to do. They do and that's what they should do. It's not evil. The federal government is the boss in the end and they shouldn't screw up capitalism. And capitalism screw up the federal government. It's very simple. They see headlines where Bank of America has to pay $18 billion in penalties. And the follow-up is, why isn't anyone going to jail? Why is it that journalists look at business results as a crime to be punished? Well, I think that <clears throat> there, there have been individuals do things in business that they should go to jail for. And they, and they, they have, and sometimes they should, and they haven't gone to jail. But there's, there's two different... There are corporate sins. I mean, take the Solomon situation. Uh, 
the fellow that committed the original act, I think he went to jail for four months. I mean, he, he is the guy that caused our problems. But the second problem was not reporting it. Now, did you send somebody to jail for that or something? I don't think so. You penalize the company big time. I don't think you put them out of business or anything of the sort. And we paid a big price for the, for the fact that, that Moser's actions were not reported to the Fed in a timely manner. It was important that the company uh, pay that fine and that we acknowledge the fact that that was a very wrong thing to do. You don't go around insulting the United States government on its regulations for selling U.S. bonds. But for an action, I think Mosher probably should have gone away for a lot longer period, but I may be biased on that. But I don't think other people should have. And, and you just have to make a determination about when the activity of some individual is criminal, I think, you know, they should be, they should be uh, 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 prosecuted. Uh, but every time a, something goes wrong at the corporate level, we've had things go wrong at the corporate level. There, I, I will promise you that in the next five years, something will happen at Berkshire that is, is the wrong thing for the, somebody at the, corpora the corporation to do. I mean, I, you know, and we'll correct it. But it's going to happen from time to time. And uh, I don't think I should <laughs> go, go to jail if one of our 330,000 people does something they shouldn't do. So far, we've got a best system. We've got a better system that we used to have, and we'll have a better system 50 years from now. Warren Buffett has seen 91 years of it, and he's never seen a period where he didn't believe that. Warren said, not every aspect would go backward. It's unbelievable to think about what has happened. We've had a civil war, we've got a great depression, we've had all these things. But business moves forward, government moves forward, and more importantly, people move forward. Lastly, Warren Buffett mentioned he is happy to tell people the same thing he has told them before, but most of them will never get the message. I hope you learned something from our video today. If you do, it would be kind of you if you can share this video with others to inspire them. Thank you for watching. To get more life-changing videos like this, don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. We are 3 Towers Investing Channel.